This bizarre world with its many hairs is in appearance very similar to a forest of baobabs. Pores seem to open like hungry little mouths. As strange as it may seem, this invisible nature is quite familiar to you. This is the surface of a leaf, magnified hundreds of times using the latest developments in electron microscopy. A technical feat achieved for the first time. Here, sap progresses in the veins of a leaf. An ejection of seeds is slowed down 2,000 times. Because plants are anything but motionless. Plants have conquered all environments, volcanic lands, dry deserts, estuaries, ice and snow, and even the asphalt of our cities. Deprived of legs, they have invented various forms of sexuality in order to conquer the world. Their strategies have enabled them to take root in the most extreme places on the planet. This is probably what our world looked like 460 million years ago, when the first land plants appeared. A land covered with pools of acid hot springs, with temperatures rising to 90 degrees Celsius. Despite such heat, some plants can grow. Around almost every hot spring, you'll find grasses of varying types growing up against the hot water. The high temperature water cools off very rapidly, such that these plants can grow in these, these environments. But there are some plants that are very, very interesting. One known as its scientific name is dicanthelium, but its more generic name is hot springs panic grass. It looks like weeds in my front yard, but but it's this grass right there with the purple edges to the uh, uh, grass leaves. This particular plant has a fungus growing associated with its roots. And researchers at Montana State University have, have shown that this fungus relationship with this plant is what allows this plant to grow at these higher, te higher temperatures and tolerate high temperatures. Um, the mechanism is not yet known, right? But somehow this fungus is imparting some protective measure or causing the plant to react some way that allows it to protect itself from these higher temperatures. Next to the acid hot springs, plant roots grow on the surface to optimize the capture of oxygen. They have also developed the capacity to withstand the heavy metals present in these hostile environments. Plants get their energy from the sun. Scientists call this photosynthesis. Algae are the first plants that appeared at the beginning of life on Earth. Unable to leave their aquatic environment, they are already masters of photosynthesis. When the temperature drops, Algae produce colored substances and sugars that act as an antifreeze. Some algae will even accept to be swallowed by gelatinous organisms whose envelope will protect them from extreme cold. During the brief summer season of Spitsberg, an archipelago near Greenland, the sun never sets. It shines 24 hours a day, an ideal season to study the growing vegetation. The Earth's crust will thaw in summer, but remains low in minerals. This severely limits the rate of growth and density of the vegetation. Wherever there's a form of shelter, where seeds accumulate, where sediments accumulate, we immediately have vegetation that settles in. Here's a typical and pretty area of Drias that is growing. 
The plants, once rooted, will try to gain ground. We can see it here, for example. So basically, the goal is to hang on and gain inches bit by bit. Just how do these plants colonize such cold, bare lands? To succeed, they group together, which enables them to store what little heat is available. An efficient way of conquering the surroundings. Some of the plants that live here are over a hundred years old. There are two explanations for this. The first is being able to resist the wind and cold temperatures, and they do this by growing in clusters. The second is the plant's compost. Plants that die leave their own fertilizer, their own organic matter, for those who come after. The generations of plants that die on this spot here form fresh earth on the surface. The grouping of plants serves as a breeding ground for other plants, such as the hairy lousewort. The plant is well acclimatized. It produces a hairy, feathery lining to protect it against the cold. The lining is so tight, it acts as insulation and plays an important role in the screening of harmful sun rays. The Edelweiss uses the same technique. Its flowers are protected by a duvet, a strategy used by many plants to avoid being naked in the cold. This technique is also used to protect plants from heat, like this cactus. Microscopic hairs allow plants to retain water, necessary for their survival. Some of them are shaped like anchors for catching droplets. Each form of hair is perfectly adapted to a particular environment. The most developed and most dense vegetation is located in an even more extreme environment, steep, sharp cliffs. Oh, look over there, can you see? Between the zones of scree where rocks have fallen, at the foot of the pillars there, you have an area covered in green. Let's go and take a look. We're going over to the steep area. We don't really know what type of terrain we'll meet. Probably very unstable. There are zones of really high erosion. It's a very steep slope there. It's very unstable. To study biodiversity, you really need to reach the ecosystem, and some are not easy to get to, but that can also be the reward, taking risks to get to places that nobody has observed. This whole area is an extreme within an extreme. Well, this is unexpected, very unexpected. Here we have plants that are in fruit or even in flower. How do these plants find organic matter in such an inhospitable environment? Finding plants at a more developed stage here, hanging on a cliff at 100 meters of altitude, is really surprising. At the same time, it's not a mystery. We're just below a bird colony, so basically their food falls from the sky. Here we have guano that brings nitrogen, the nutrient material which also allows a whole host of bacteria, plants, mosses and lichens to colonize this environment. Lichens are a combination of algae and fungi that fragment in order to multiply. It may take them 50 years to cover one square centimeter. Within the lichen, the fungus filaments capture water and minerals and provide protection for the algae. The algae captures light for photosynthesis and brings energy to the fungus. Symbiosis is their force. Other plants have invented more radical solutions in order to survive in nutrient-poor environments. 
Venus flytraps naturally live on the border of North and South Carolina in the southeast part of the United States. This is the only place in the world that they are naturally found. It's an area of about 20 square miles or about 40 square kilometers. Why aren't all plants carnivorous? And the answer is both simple and complicated. On the simple side, first off, really we can say that all plants really are carnivorous because all plants get minerals and nutrients through their roots and those minerals and nutrients are basically made up of dead animals that have rotted and decomposed in the soil and the plants are sucking those up. But the kinds of carnivorous plants that we see where the leaves have actually changed shape to make traps, this is very different. Uh, and this is an accident of evolution that probably happened about 50 million years ago. It actually happened about six times among the entire plant kingdom. And some plants, those plants growing in very nutrient poor conditions, evolved a particular mutation to allow them to capture insects and extract the minerals and nutrients directly from the insects. How do these plants catch insects? How do they move so fast without having muscles and nerves? The Venus flytrap is taking the energy that's stored in water, pumping it out very quickly to close the trap, and then repumping that water back in to reset the trap. It's at the hinge of the trap that cells fill with water, causing the closure of the lobes. These tiny hairs trigger the trap. When prey successfully touches two sensory hairs within 20 seconds, it activates the death trap that immediately closes. For the plant, the advantage is obvious. A small twig will not action the trap for nothing. Only the agitation of an insect is likely to trigger a second hair. The sensitivity of the hairs is so finely adjusted that the fall of raindrops will not trigger the trap. How does the plant manage to eat such large prey? Carnivorous plants are not only mouths, but also stomachs. They use these multiple red enzymes to reduce their prey to a pulp. The plant secretes enzymes, just like people have digestive enzymes in their stomachs that dissolve the insect. And then the plant just absorbs all the nutrients in the juices that were left from the dissolved insect. Carnivorous plants only digest the soft flesh of their prey. All that remains is the insect's exoskeleton. It takes a Venus flytrap about three to five days to completely digest an ant or a fly that it has caught. The Venus flytrap will only dine three or four times in its life before turning black and wilting. Most carnivorous plants live in swamps, happily obliging Aaron Ellison to use his homemade kayak to approach them. Sundews, or plants a lot like sundews, are probably the most primitive or ancient type of carnivorous plant. This sort of pattern of a sticky trap, then a more complicated trap having evolved, has occurred at least five or six times in all of the plant kingdom. Sundews are the primitive group followed next in their evolutionary sequence by the Asian pitcher plants and followed next in the evolutionary sequence by Venus flytraps. It may be primitive, but this glue trap is highly efficient. Each ball glows in the sun like a dewdrop and acts as a magnet to attract insects. It contains a powerful sticky glue any insect that lands is stuck with no chance of escape.
The efforts of this fly to escape its trap are in vain. Once immobilized, it will be dissolved by round enzymes along the stem. Pitcher plants are considered advanced as carnivorous plants go because they have a variety of methods that they use to both attract and trap and digest insects. The pitcher plant has these hairs that point downward so that when the insect tries to crawl back up, it gets caught in these hairs and falls further into the plant. The inside of the pitcher is coated with a very, very fine wax that allows the pitcher plants to act like a sliding board for the insects to slide down into the very bottom where they're captured and digested. The electron microscope reveals this amazing forest of hair, all pointing in the same direction, stopping any prey from climbing out. Other species have replaced hairs by small tiles in which insects' legs become trapped. Some hairs are even equipped with glue on their tip. Carnivorous plants have evolved to adapt according to varying sizes and types of prey. There are over 500 varieties of carnivorous plants that live in swamps, but some are not where you'd expect them to be.